on the top. Thank you. And she vows and declares that because of that, um, she doesn't pronounce words correctly to this day. And she may be wrong.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. I am Reverend Corey Alexander Willett, and it is my joy to be the pastor here at St. Bethlehem. This morning, our district superintendent, Reverend Pat Frudenthal, is with us and will be joining me in presiding at the table today, and we are thankful for her presence with us. A few more announcements before we get started. First is that UMW Night Circle will be meeting this week on Thursday, May 5th at 6.30 p.m. Two weeks from today, UMW will be hosting a potato bar luncheon at 11 o'clock after the Sunday school hour. Donations will be accepted to help sponsor our UMW local missions projects. We will have eat in plates and to go plates, depending on your preference. Also, if we have any graduates, college or high school, in our midst, uh, please submit their names to the church office. We'll be celebrating any graduates we have on May 29th here in worship. Newsletters are available in the Narthex for pickup. If you do not receive it by email, please be sure to pick up your newsletter today. Also, our May, June upper rooms are available at both entrances to the sanctuary. And finally, Please be sure to fill out the attendance pad at the end of your pew so that we know you were with us today. And now, most importantly, I want you to know that whether this is your first time or you have been attending for years, whether you are strong in your faith or you still have some questions, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. And I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. Sing praises to God, you people of faith. We give thanks to God, who heals and restores. Praise God, who transforms us, who heals and loves us. Praise God, who loves us to Do not be silent. Praise the Lord. We give thanks to our God. I invite you now to stand as you're able as we sing together hymn number 307, Christ is Risen. Pilate was crucified, dead, and buried. 
The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Surprise us and open our hearts to new directions. Transform our hearts and minds as we listen with anticipation for your word. Amen. Amen. You may remain seated as we sing together hymn number 2086 in the faith we sing, kind of open our eyes. We will sing it through twice. Good morning, St. Pete. Good morning. Our scripture lesson today is from Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for the letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you, have, whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city and you will be told what you want to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, 
Get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him to, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house he laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother, Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples of, of, in Damascus, and immediately began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue and saying, He is the Son of God. Words of God for the people of God. Thank you. We all love a good conversion story. We love hearing about how someone struggling with addiction finds Christ and is brought into the light. We long to hear the stories of deathbed acceptance of Christ. We want to know that we have helped people have their own Damascus experience. We have books and seminars and classes dedicated to evangelism. It's how we mark our success as Christians and as a church. And while evangelism is definitely one sermon I could preach today, it's not the one I'm preaching. Because I think that just preaching about evangelism doesn't quite get to the depth of this story. Saul's conversion is more than just a triumphant Christian over a Jewish persecutor. And in order for it to be more than that, we can't think of this conversion in the ways we view them today. Because Saul and the people Saul was persecuting, these people of the way, were two groups within the same religious tradition. And when we think about it that way, that Saul and the way were the same denomination, the same belief system, it sure does feel like it hits a little bit closer to home. No matter what, we do know that Saul did indeed have an encounter with Christ that radically changed the course of his life. But instead of comparing it to our current understanding of conversion, I invite us to explore the similarities between Saul's story and Moses' encounter with the burning bush. Both of these stories include the appearance of fire or light, a divine voice calling out their human name twice, and these humans seeking to know the name of the divine, and then being sent out by that same divine. Both stories turn out to be life-changing events for both Moses and Saul, in a key similarity in both stories, however, <laughs> pertains not to anything or anyone present in the scene. 
but instead those who are not. In both stories, the divine voice identifies with those who have been other, those who have been pressed to the margins and subject to suffering by those with more power than them. In both stories, the divine sees the suffering of the people and advocates on their behalf. And in a striking moment in this story, when Saul asked to know who confronted and addressed him by name, the voice responded saying, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. And when we hear Jesus say those words to Saul, we can't help but hear when Jesus tells the disciples, what you have done to the least of these, you have done to me. We hear Jesus tell Saul that he stands in solidarity with those who Saul has been persecuting. Jesus is always found with those on the margins. And in Jesus' answer to Saul, he is also asking Saul to see the divine within those he is persecuting. Not only does his encounter with Jesus change his understanding of who the divine is, but it also changes Saul's understanding of the fact that the image of God is contained within each of us, including those suffering his persecution. And we know that he was persecuting them because he could not imagine any possible reconciliation between their beliefs and his own. He couldn't see past their differences to see their humanity. Paul was insistent about how he saw Christ and how those who followed Christ and believed that everyone needed to see Christ exactly as he did. There was no seeing past any of these theological differences. It wasn't until Saul was directly confronted by Christ and had hands laid on him by Ananias that the scales fell away from his eyes and he was able to see once more, both physically and spiritually. He was able to bear witness to the divinity of Christ and the divinity found within humanity. Last week, I was having dinner with my parents and my aunt and uncle. My uncle is a retired Presbyterian pastor who lives up in Cowan, Tennessee, and he and my aunt attend more worship services in a week than I thought was humanly possible. And they are theologically different than his own PCUSA tradition. They attend St. Mary's Convent. They attend a Lutheran church. They attend whatever service is going on that week. They attend several on Sunday. And so we were talking after dinner, and he began to tell us about all of the different services he had been to during Holy Week and Easter. And one of the ones was when he attended when they attended St. Mary's Convent, which is a very high church place. And he was talking about how there were some parts that he could agree with. He was trying not to get too Lutheran on them. He was also, though, a little bit uncomfortable with some of the things that they were saying because they differed from his own understanding of who God is. But even in the midst of that, he was able to find pieces of his own tradition and understanding within the service. This then led into a broader conversation about 
theological and ecumenical differences and the ways in which we are more willing to see the differences than we are to see the places of similarity within the church. And the conversation did eventually turn to what is currently going on within our own United Methodist Church. The pending split, the dialogue surrounding it, the grief, and even the hope that accompanies it. And then the conversation eventually turned to the way Christianity and nationalism are viewed today. There are definitely times when we act more like pre-Damascus Saul than post-Damascus Paul. We struggle to see the divinity in the people across the aisle from us. We villainize those who have beliefs and practices different than our own. And then we get to Ananias. Because he is a crucial part of this story. Because he demonstrates for us the respect for theological differences while not condoning the actions that accompany them. Ananias is resistant to going and finding this Saul because he is deeply aware of the evil Saul was doing and did not want to succumb to his persecution. Ananias is very rightfully anxious about the Lord's command for him. And he is able to see that the image of God is also contained within Saul. And these two things are held in tension with one another. And in that tension, we do find new understandings of our own ability to witness the divine. We don't have to look very hard or very far to see where people are being marginalized in the name of religion. We don't have to look very far to see that we are in desperate need of the transforming work of Christ in our world. But what if that transformation was drastically different than we expected to? What if, instead of being led by a powerful king, it is led by a babe born in a manger? What if we are too caught up in our own inability to see past our differences, to recognize that Christ is indeed transforming the world around us? When we encounter Christ, we fall to the ground. The scales fall from our eyes and we rise to change people. And as we live into the new life offered to us by Christ, we know that we are called to see beyond our differences and find the image of God in one another. We are invited into Christ's transforming work and to see the work that is already happening around us. Even if there is a different understanding of how the work is done. And maybe we can see the conversion is deeper than we often give it credit for. Maybe we continue to see with new eyes the divine around us. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers forward for this morning's offer. Let us pray. 
Oh God, you are among us. You are with us, pouring your Holy Spirit upon us. Oh God, we now offer back to you a fraction of what you have given to us. May our gifts be used to further your kingdom on earth and show that your image is contained within each of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, there are a few prayer requests we'd like to lift up. First is we want to remember Grace Manning. This week she is having surgery on Friday, so we want to keep her in our prayers. We also want to remember Margaret's daughter, Teresa Atkins, who has several ongoing health concerns. Are there other joys or concerns we'd like to lift up this morning? Seeing none. Oh, Robert, yes. Uh, Mom's got a new great grandson this week that was born. Mary Nysky has a new great grandson that was born this week. Justin and Dorkin, uh, baby boy, on Tuesday. 
a baby born on Tuesday. Are there any others? Seeing none, let us go to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, God of transformation and witness, God who is with us through all things, we give you thanks for this day, for the ability and the opportunity to gather together to worship your holy name. But God, we know that when we come into this space, we are unconditionally loved. We are unconditionally welcomed. And we experience your Holy Spirit moving through us. Oh God, we also bring our full selves to this space. We bring our excitement and our joy and also our grief and burdens. Oh God, there is nothing that we could bring into this space that would make you love us any less. Oh God, we lift up to you prayers for our world in the midst of violence, prayers for our nation in the midst of division, prayers for our community as we face this world together. And we lift up all of the prayers of our hearts, knowing that no matter what they are, no matter if we do not yet have words for them, you hear each and every one of them. You hold us closely, and you never let us go. Oh God, strengthen us so that we might be witnesses to your love and grace. We might be witnesses to the divine around us. And so that we might see your image fully in one another. Oh God, for these things and all things we pray. In your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. On this first Sunday of the month, on this Communion Sunday, we remember that this is not my table. This is not St. Bethlehem's table. This is not the United Methodist Church's table. This is Christ's table. And at Christ's table, all are welcomed, all are invited, no matter what. When we move into our time of service, our
ushers will direct you forward and you are invited to kneel at the altar and our servers will then give you the bread and the cup and you are invited to take and eat and then I will dismiss you with a blessing. Any money left on the altar rail goes to our Helping Hands Fund, which goes to assist our community, our community members in need. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who seek to live in peace with one another, who earnestly repent of their sins. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so with your people of earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn, saying, Holy, 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 Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead, and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into a marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks, gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took a cup. It was the cup of peace, the cup of Elijah. The words aren't up here. It's okay. The Prince of Peace took the cup of peace. He gave thanks and he blessed it. And he gave it to everyone there. The ones who would desert him. The ones who would deny him. The ones who would betray him. 
He gave it to all of them. He said, drink of this. My blood, which is given for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by the disciples in the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in you with Christ offering for us as we proclaim that great mystery of faith, saying, Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry in all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we get to feast at that heavenly banquet. Amen? Amen. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as confident children of God, let us pray to the Holy Spirit the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. One cup given to all. At this time, I invite those assisting in communion to come forward. table is set and you are welcome.
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have revealed yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we come to the close of our service this morning, I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together. Hymn number 378, Amazing Grace.
friends, siblings in Christ, the divine is all around us. The divine is within us, and we are invited to be witnesses to it. And so, go in peace, in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. Amen. Amen.